everyone. Thank you for joining us here today as part of the Art Town celebration. My name is Christine Johnson. I'm the director here at the Sparks Heritage Museum. And I'd like to welcome those of you who are here at our um, capacity seating event. And welcome to all of you on Facebook, joining us on Facebook Live. And if you're going to be watching this on our website, um, and you haven't yet liked us on Facebook, this is your chance because we're hoping that this inaugural Facebook Live event will be the beginning of many more to come. And we can't be happier to start this off uh, than with our guest today, uh, Robin Oliver. She was a film commissioner for more than 20 years. We're happy to host her here today, and she'll be speaking about a variety of topics relating to her two books. So without further ado, again, thank you for joining us here in person or digitally, and I turn it over to Thank you, Christine. And thank you to the Sparks Heritage Museum for putting on this event um, and Art Town for really adding to our community and the cultural scene here. Uh, today's topics are actually going to be uh, specifically about art and our relation to movies, but first you can move to the next slide. I just want to say that uh, even before COVID, the fashion statements were made. Uh, the, the first reading I'm going to do from the book Around the World in 80 Movies is called Dust and Illusions at Burning Man. Now this book, which the title sounds familiar, Around the World in 80, oh, not days, movies. The idea is how movies and travel blend together. When I travel, and I love traveling, I like to watch the places I'm going, see something about it on the screen. So each chapter has a personal travel vignette and the suggestions of movies or television shows that you can watch if you are going to this destination. It may not have been filmed there, but it might have some more theme. So, Around the World in 80 Movies, Dust and Illusion at Burning Man. I have to put on glasses for this next shot as I start reading. Okay, from the book. Next shot, let's see what it is. Here it is. I didn't mean to stare at several hundred penises. I have blotted most of them out for this um, censored photo, but we can go to the next one. There they dangle at the Barbie Death Camp and Wine Bistro, one of my favorite installations in Black Rock City, Nevada. The temporary community brings 70,000 people to Burning Man, a world famous annual Labor Day celebration of art and life. The bistro features Nazi dolls driving a few hundred naked Barbies into the kitchen ovens. We put the Barbie in barbecue, close to the sign. Perusing my album's photos from the previous year, my husband Fred put the camp pie on his must-see list of city wonders. No problem, I said, guiding our bicycle straight to streets marked 330 and D. Black Rock City's theme camps lie in concert-style seating. You can show that in the next slide, I think on a clear map grid. Laid out in a semi-circle starting with the letter A, streets radiate outward through the alphabet with words expressing the year's theme. Perpendicular streets use numbers with clock time from 9 o'clock through 2 o'clock. Here we are, I said, expecting the usual smattering of afternoon loungers drinking and admiring dolls. Let's see a doll. There's a doll to admire. Instead, I saw a pink mask of naked men. My confusion evaporated with the blast of a bullhorn. Naked pub crawl, glared the announcer. The naked pub crawl starts here. Clothed in practical hiking gear, protecting most of our fair skin, Fred and I stood out like black sheep as we skidded along alkali, slowing our bikes to confer about our next action. A guy walked by, bobbles flopping from his personal jewels. Nice, I flirted, not specifying which jewels I preferred. Thanks, he replied, moving on to join the crowd. I think there's another shot of the um, death camp here. Yeah, you can see in the far corner the Nazi dolls working with, you know, Burning Man is known for its tastefulness, of course. <laughs> the naked pub crawl proves Burning Man avoids the been there, done that syndrome. Experiences change every year, as shown in Oliver Ronin's excellent documentary, Dust and Illusions. Burning Man's founders prohibit feature film commercialism, so documentary served as the cinematic source for learning about the time, money, and ingenuity participants display as 
artist putting together complicated camps or pieces erected on the Black Rock City's central playa. Let's see what that next picture is. Well, that's the basic idea of what it looks like. Uh, one of the world's foremost art events, Burning Man, Welcome to the Gibbering Styles. Set on the barren stretch of Black Rock Desert, about two hours north of Reno, the festival suits three-dimensional installation pieces combining beauty and engineering. Let's see if the next one is a beautiful piece of engineering. It certainly is. You can see something like that in Las Vegas. A lot of the art moves on to other locations, as I'll mention. Audience participation enhances pieces designed for touching, feeling, climbing, entering, adding graffiti, and of course, burning. A few pieces find permanent homes, like the Believe sign, uh, the Believe sign that's in downtown Reno right now. However, most works emphasize the moment, exemplified by the event's title character, a giant wooden, wooden figure, a reminiscent of the Wicker Man in its tale of pagan rituals. Following the man's demise Saturday night, the temple goes up in flames Sunday with heartfelt offerings left by the burners in a spirit of sharing and emotion. Though media coverage focuses on penises, breasts, drugs, and hedonistic behavior, the event cherishes a thoughtful community. Burners help, sharing and respecting others' needs. With commercial transactions forbidden, bartering rules, instead of handing over bills to the man fixing your pancake breakfast, and I have a shot of that, there's a man fixing my pancake breakfast, you bring your own plate and give him a hug. Whoops, <laughs> we got to the next shot. <laughs> Camps and operations encourage gifting. For instance, the Black Rock City Post Office stamps and mails your cards for free. Friends stood waiting, writing a message when a woman came up to the window and asked the operator for a pen. Only if you kiss me, he responded. She pointed to Fred. I'd rather kiss him. Later, Trent scoped out other purveyors of goods, including bars. So they'll give us wine, he asked. Let's stop that one. We parked our bar bikes at Spanky's. I sidled up and addressed the server. What's the deal here? OK, she said. You need your own cup. Otherwise, you get a Spanky before it will give you wine. Hmm, I said, presenting Fred with a game plan. Our camp is around the corner. We can ride over there fast and come back with plastic cups. I suggested, sure, he said, and we tooled off to get appropriate equipment. Arriving back at Spanky's, we presented cups and sat back, back to watch the show. The song relaxed most as a gorgeous, nearly naked man danced at the bar. Covered with metallic spray paint, he wore a skimpy, silvery thong, a burning man necklace, and red sunglasses. My kind of happy hour. Thought as I settled into a dusty bean bag chair, a cupless woman arrived asking for wine. She had to pay the price. The dancer jumped down and strutted towards us, targeting the negligent woman and bending her over for a spanking. Okay, you can show that next shot. Maybe I should have left my cup back at camp. There should be another shot. There it is. And this is an art museum uh, at times up here, an art gallery. We can have a little bit of semi nudity, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the requested in the value of cups, I knew I needed a parking space, but the one I arranged ahead of time had disappeared. A stranger named Ramon let me park in his camp while I hunted other options. With space at premium, I asked Ramon about parking overnight if we promised to move the vehicle in the morning. Anytime, I said, early, 5.30, 6. Tell you what, he said. I don't have to leave until Sunday, and I'm the only one you're walking. You can stay here. So next shot. Hey, thanks, Ramon. That was really nice of you. Uh, in a spirit of gifting, I did leave him with a gallon jug of rum on my way out. <laughs> in the meantime, our friend Susan Moore, who may be at home watching this on Facebook, I hope, our hikes, our friend Susan Moore calculated our hikes compared to the space in our vehicle. She cleared her van, and that's spread next to her van. You may think you fit with your CRV, she said, looking at our large frames and disagreeing with our assessment, but try the van. Susan up the anti, anti by insisting we sit under her camp shade and join her for dinner. Next shot shows Susan. I need to use the chicken and beef tonight, so I'm counting on you two, she said. I know you eat a lot, plus I need a cook. She handed the meat for Fred to prepare as reciprocation. We showed up only to discover the illusory security of our advanced preparations had blown away. 
Yet a new wind set everything we needed. Here's a new wind. Friends, food, fabulous art, wine, and a stimulating dancer. Dust settled to reveal clear reality of people at their best. So that's a little piece about Burning Man. And next, we get to think about some movies to see. If you're planning to go to Burning Man, anybody planning to go to Burning Man? Well, not this year, we can. So, next slide. As I mentioned in the book, uh, pretty much the Burning Man founders did not want to have commercial filming about Burning Man. So when I was film commissioner, if I got a phone call about, hey, I want to film that Burning Man, I just sent them to the directors who pretty much always said no. They had the right to do that. They have all the permitting. They're in charge of the Black Rock Desert while Burning Man goes on. There are, however, a number of documentaries that they've approved. And you can find, you can see a whole list online. This is one of the stronger ones that covers the first 30 years of Burning Man. So if you want to know a little bit about the history, it started actually at a beach in the Bay Area and then later moved to Black Rock Desert, which had the space for what they wanted to do and some of the theories and ideas of what they do there. This is a very good documentary. It is available online. Now, despite what I just said, next slide. <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, the founders thought, no, oh, maybe we will allow a feature film. There was a group of um, university students from Spain who had been to Burning Man. They were so inspired by it that they wanted to do a film there. They wanted to loosely base it on Orpheus and Eurydice, you know, a, a nice old Greek legend. And the founders said, okay, yeah, give it, let's give it a try. Um, it turned out that the founders didn't exactly love the movie. It's, Sort of a rom-com, not exactly that funny, but kind of light, not as heavy as you'd expect from Greek myth origins. Uh, it does showcase a lot of what happens at Burning Man very well. The cinematography looks great. Um, but it, you know, it was never going to be a commercial movie either, really. It's a master's project from some students from Barcelona. However, they were able to sell it, and you can see it on Netflix. It's not a bad watch, but you will, as locals, find a couple of weird things. Um, how about arriving from London at the Reno Stead Airport instead? <laughs> uh, I know, I've gone to London and I've returned to Reno and I never arrived in a puddle jumper at the um, Reno Stead Airport. But it, that does happen in the book, and it says Reno, so for the average viewer, it works. Uh, I think that one of the main complaints from the founders would be something that kind of happened to me in the story I just read is that you are supposed to be a survivalist. Uh, the Boy Scout motto, and the Boy Scout motto doesn't follow, follow all the burning men, but be prepared. Um, you are expected to bring everything you're going to need. Now, granted, I thought I had a parking spot, and I did have food, and I did have wine. Did I get anything else? Anyway, um, I knew what it was about. Here's the, it's uh, extreme um, car camping at times, but you need to have all your water, all your supplies. The guy in this movie sells, that, sells his guitar at home and arrives at the Dino Stead Airport with nothing but the clothes on his back. That is not recommended for participating. Burning so that's one of the major inaccuracies of the story. But otherwise, you can certainly watch it and recognize a few things from our region. Next slide um, is a commercial film that actually shot on the Black Rock Desert. And uh, it's called Far From Home. If you Google Far From Home, you'll see that name come up in a number of different ways, including Spider-Man. It's not that one. This is with Drew Barrymore. Uh, if those of you who can see the PowerPoint presentation, yeah, Drew's not very old. She was about 13 when she made this movie. Uh, I had a lot of fun dealing with it. Uh, the location manager that came out asked for a small, isolated, kind of deserty town, not any further than one hour from Reno. So I showed her from Hades and a few other places around. Nothing really grabbed her. We were on the Pyramid Highway, I think we looked at Nixon. I said, if you keep driving another hour, we'll get to Burlock. And she's like, nah, you know, one hour. So she laughed. I figured, well, we gave it a try. Um, they went to Utah. They liked one of the towns they saw in Utah, and they gathered afterwards and ordered a 
beer and couldn't get served a beer in Utah. And I got a phone call <laughs> from the manager saying, well, we wanted beer and everyone keeps saying I should have looked at Ger Gerlach. So she came back, looked at Gerlach, and we got the movie. Now, Gerlach is not an easy place to do a major feature film, even though this is a low budget feature film. Um, there's not much in the way of lodging. There is no airport, so they had to fly, not to Reno Stead, they had to fly to the Reno Airport, and then rent a puddle jumper and rent a bed for a lock. Um, the, there is the girl lock motel, but, and it was sort of available, because during the winter it's filled with teachers, teacher just During the fall it's filled with hunters. But in the summertime there were a few rooms there, so we could put some of the people up there. Try to imagine Drew Barrymore walking around Gerlach for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Most of the cast and crew brought their own little RVs and created little camps in the town. A few years later, I was talking with Jennifer Tilly. I don't know if you remember her from Bullets Over Broadway, um, but she was in this movie, and she said it was one of the most fun films she ever worked on because even when they film on location, you go back to your hotel room and you can do your own stuff, but in Gerlach, Everybody had to hang together, and when there was a stunt like burning a car, everybody grabbed long chairs and sat around and cheered. And, and she said there was just a camaraderie from filming in Gerlach that was a lot of fun. There was actually filming on the Black Rock Desert, uh, built a set here. And, uh, this was another interesting little story that emerged from it. With all these vehicles and such, a lot of dust was created. You get the idea of dust by the masks I was wearing earlier, dust and illusions. So there's a rancher in the area, and he sees all this dust off in the distance in the desert. Not very burning, man, it's just really odd. So he calls the sheriff to report the cattle whistle. <laughs> well, I mean, what else is going to go on in the Black Rock Desert? <laughs> so it gave the film crew uh, a sense of, yeah, we chose the right place. <laughs> They had never had anything like that happen before. Next slide is going to some Burning Man themes. Now, the founders insist that the Wicker Man did not influence their idea of having a Burning Man. And so this movie is not about Burning Man, and it certainly isn't. Um, but it does have a very isolated place, uh, sort of some pagan rituals that go on, including uh, making a man of Wicker at the end and burning him up. Um, it actually became a cult favorite. It is available to rent on, I think, Amazon and uh, Charter on demand. Uh, the, but you want to be sure you rent the first version, uh, the one from the 1970s, which was written by Anthony Schaefer. He did Lion in Winter. Pretty good script. Um, it has Edward Woodward and uh, Christopher Lee, good cast. There is a remake out there, which has a good director, and you'll get the one. Ute and um, the actor Nicholas Cage, it just doesn't really work as well as the first. So if you want to get a kind of a Burning Man sense, um, you go out to the Isle of Sky is where it filmed, so definitely nothing to do with Burning Man there, but uh, a fun movie to watch in that sense. Fun, and eh, it's a horror film, and if you saw Midsummer last year, you see some of the, the same themes in that one. Next slide is another thematic type of thing. I think any of the Mad Max movies give you a sense of some of what you see out at Burning Man. It's a vast desert. People dress in really distinctive costumes. They have fun vehicles, interesting looking vehicles that they drive around in. However, um, at Burning Man, you can't drive faster than five miles an hour. And if you watch the Mad Max movies, they drive a lot faster than that. But they always seem to have a a sensibility that you'll see out on Burning Man. Thunderdome would be the one to catch because actually some of the Burning Man camp people decided to build a Thunderdome, which is a big cage that has a gladiator style contest where people swing around and try to hit each other and do that sort of thing. It's actually in the movie Girl from the Song. You can see what it looks like in that. Um, and it's serious because they always have a sign posted out there that says, Time elapsed since last injury, and it never says zero. <laughs> so, um, besides Thunderdome, I have a couple of other suggestions. 
Next slide is Nowhere in Nevada. Uh, this may be some by some people who are very well known for participating in Burning Man. It isn't about Burning Man, but it definitely has a link to that. If we're driving to Burning Man here in Reno, you know, we go straight up here on the highway, but the people who are coming from the east will be driving on Interstate 80. They often stop at Middlegate, which is where some scenes of Nowhere in Nevada take place. Uh, Middle Gate does wrap about being in the middle of nowhere, which is a good sensibility for Burning Man. It's available, uh, I actually checked it out in the Washington County Library, so when the library opens again, you can take a look at that. Final idea for Burning Man movies. <clears throat> One of the, um, my favorite camps at Burning Man, Bad Idea Theater. I don't know that they ever showed this one, God Monster of Indian Flats. This is, uh, it's a Nevada movie, so you know, as a film commissioner, I'm always happy to uh, talk about Nevada movies. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> this one is about a giant sheep. Um, this little lamb is exposed to noxious mine gases, which you know, turn it into a giant sheep that can walk on two legs, and it goes into Virginia City and terrorizes the residents there, which, as you can see, is a very bad idea. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it is, luckily, it's free to watch on Amazon Prime. It is an amazing experience. Um, Indian Flat is actually American Flat, and that's where the movie filmed, which is also where some of the Drew Barrymore movie, Far From Home, filmed. So that is part one of tonight, today's presentation about burning. Oh, you can show the next slide. What's the next slide? That's eh, just my books which are available here. You can move on to the next slide stuff. But, um, open it up to any questions about Burning Man, some of the movies we talked about. Well, where did they, some of those gigantic structures they have there, they yes. have to bring them in big flatbeds. Where are those uh, like vehicles parked in Burning Man? Well, the, uh, Burning Man has been able to purchase a lot of land up there. So they have some warehousing. They have a lot of other, a lot of resources available. Um, they have a grant program for artists, so they, the main art out in the central playa, plaza, like you, playa, like you saw the, the woman and that sort of thing. Those people have received grants towards building, and they're out there months ahead of time sometimes. Do they own a crane out there to lift these structures up? I don't know all the equipment they own now, but they do. The artists originally were required to pretty much do all of it, but there's a lot more resources available now. And it's a year on a ground operation, so you know, there, are, there are storage facilities and a lot of other things that go on with it. I'm not part of the operation, although of course it's, a lot of it's based here in Reno, there you can find a lot of it there. Um, my husband, Fred, who when I, he wasn't sure he wanted to go to Burning Man. He ended up loving it um, from an engineering perspective. Just amazed him. How could they do the types of art projects they do? They're a combination of art and engineering. They're just brilliant. And it is a world-class art event. When I would be at trade shows overseas, people were always asking me about Burning Man. They had definitely heard of it in Australia and London and Korea and other places. So it's, it's put us on the map in ways that sometimes we didn't appreciate here at home. I think we understand it better. Uh, but uh, is the generator still an active group here? Where they the space? I, or I think it is. Yeah. Uh, although the Morris Hotel itself is closed, so I don't know exactly the setting. I'm not a Birmingham artist, so I don't know that aspect. My friend Susan Moore, who was pictured in there. Uh, knows a whole lot of, more about all of the, the daily operations and the yearly operations and the disappointment for so many that it couldn't happen this year. But yeah, it's totally impressive. The thing is, you can't just stop in as a day tripper. You have to buy your ticket. That's another unrealistic part of um, the girl from the song. The guy didn't even have a ticket when he arrived. Now he was able to get one. But really, if you're interested in Burning Man, you need to do some prep. You can buy a ticket and go for just a day, but it's an expensive ticket. However, I'd say it's probably worth it. It is a, a very stunning experience out there. Uh, I, the first day, time I went, I was I really did just go as a day. Um, they used to have a program that let, let some of us go look at, at the art. 
And um, I was heading back to the car eventually with two other friends. And so, uh, a vehicle came by with a bunch of people I knew, and they were like, hey, Robin. So I chased after them, pulled me up, and we're walking, we're talking, and they're having such a great time. And I see my friends shrinking in the distance. So I jumped off and ran back, and we went off. And I, I vowed I would come back and see much, much more of it. You gotta see it at night. It's really, uh, it's not a day trip kind of thing. And that's what the, the founders want. They want involvement. Um, it's also performance art. So if somebody comes up to you and starts talking, um, it's, it's kind of like improv. You don't say no, you just keep rolling with whatever routine's going on. Like I said, I tend to dress like a hiker. I'm a little too practical for burning man tastes. And so I've been pushed in the dirt and rolled around a couple times, but you know, you can't be too clean there. I have another question. You're going to let somebody else get it from one end. Are you ready? Okay. Go for it. The Barbie doll display that, that uh -huh. you saw there, show there. Was that for anybody to come and burn a couple of Barbie dolls, or could you rescue a couple of Barbie dolls from death? Yeah. I mean, what were you doing then? That's a good idea. It's, it's just an installation art piece. Somebody with a, I don't know, it was a group of people with a whole lot of free time who spent a lot of time dressing their dolls, making Nazi uniforms, uh, doing everything they did, but no, they didn't have a rescue program when I was there. That's a good idea. Yeah, they were burning them in the oven? No, no, it was just installation and it was kitchen ovens. So uh, it was definitely a tacky exhibit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Party yeah, that's what, you know, and you probably could have staged it, and it would have gone, they would have gone along with it. It would have been very understanding. But most of the people just got glasses of wine, sat around, and admired the installation piece. And the, the wine, you know, you, you come along with a lot of things to give away to people and to barter with people. They don't like the exchange of money. I like your idea, though, about uh, rescue of art. Um, I also have in my book a chapter about having, in Georgia, having gone to the Cabbage Patch Nursery. And I, I started thinking, oh God, Birmingham, you know, the Cabbage Patch Borscht Soup Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a lot of things that can go on to clean man. Um, one of my favorite booths, they, there was a stand where you could go get dental floss. After a few nights, you really like stands like that. <laughs> Any other questions about Burning Man? Well, since we're doing Art Town, I thought I'd focus on artists. In my book, I have a chapter. Well, the book's broken down. Um, we were trying to do genres, but it's not really that. It's movies and locations for lovers, for wine lovers, for food lovers, and we're doing art lovers today, assuming we all love art, at least to some degree. So in the uh, book, besides Burning Man and in the art chapter, I have a chapter about uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, Lust for Life in Provence. But I'm not going to read from that. I'm, I'm going ahead. Assuming I sell enough copies of this book, um, we're having around the world in 80 more movies. And I wanted to pick uh, somebody I thought was a very cinematic artist. So this is a little bit of an art lecture with some travel. Um, and hopefully some fun, too. Uh, how many here know about the artist Caravaggio? Yay. Um, I didn't know much, maybe we'll talk about that. But this is going to be Caravaggio in Malta, Rome, and Texas. And uh, again, it's a Caravaggio headhunting expedition. This one, because I don't have a book that is printed in, is on paper. Okay, at first it seems that a classic film like the Maltese Falcon, featuring the stuff that made dreams are made of, rightfully inspires a trip to Malta. But the push for me came from an artist whose dramatic, controversial life seemed right out of the movie, one involving genius, glory, and murder. But beyond the soap opera elements of his personal story, the artist known as Caravaggio earned the respect of film historians and movie makers for his views on staging and lighting. Back in the 1500s, Caravaggio never imagined anything resembling a motion picture, but his vision fueled the Italian neorealist movie style, 
while directors like Martin Scorsese and Mel Gibson enthusiastically acknowledge the painter's impact on their works. Now, the next slide explains a little of how I got there. This familiarity may explain why my first look at reproductions of Caravaggio's paintings grabbed me. It happened while preparing for a public television show called Book Talk, where nationally known humanities scholar and host Clay Jenkinson gave me a frequent guest. He assigned Peter Robb's M, the man who became Caravaggio, and I found it extra re rewarding to go online and pull up an image of a painting as I read about its inception. This in turn made me want to go see the real versions. Next slide. As a result, Malta rose on my list of places to see since Caravaggio fled there as a fugitive from a murder charge, seeking protection in return for providing paintings, two of which hang at St. John's Co Cathedral in the capital city of Valletta. This includes his only known signed work, The Beheading of John the Baptist, horrific topic, and yet intriguing on multiple levels. You can go to that picture. In this and other works, Caravaggio heightens cinematic sensations by placing his characters at angles revealing intense expressions. Their positions and body language able to tell stories in quick visual flashes. Malta might seem like a long way to go for the chance to view a painting, but my husband Fred never raised an eyebrow about my compulsion. After all, let's go to the next slide. I once booked us to Dublin for a day trip because the taking of the Christ hangs at Ireland's National Gallery. I should say I was in London, but it was still a long day trip. The words of the word comes from a wild history covered in Jonathan Parr's exciting book, The Lost Painting, with Clive Cussler elements in the hunt for a missing Caravaggio canvas. But I occasionally test Fred's limits, like the time in Rome where he needed great Italian espresso. Let's go to Rome here. Next slide, yep, that's the Pantheon, um, to perkin off for more, more sightseeing. Our guidebook advised Casa de Oro on the Via Alfani near the Pantheon. Okay, I said to Boy Scout Fred, who stood armed with his streetwise map. Over there, it says Via Alfani. We walked down the street, but our exhaustion conquered Fred's map reading skills, and we missed the location. Odd, because, um, <laughs> I easily spotted Tox's uh, yellow and red sign while watching Tom Hanks' Adventures in the movie version of Angels and Demons. Oh no. It's not here, said Boy Scout Fred, who aims at bidding to any mistakes in his map reading skills. This reluctance inspired me to add, it must be out of business. I arched an eyebrow doubtfully, but before pursuing the matter, I noticed the sign for San Luigi de Franceschi Church. Next slide. I stiffened happily, eyes widening with anticipation. Caravaggio paintings hang in there, I explained with the enthusiasm of a hound catching a deer's scent. In that moment, Fred probably felt more of a need for a cup of gold coffee rather than Baroque oils, but he gratefully left on this excuse to stop hunting for a place he couldn't find. We walked in the dimly lit church to absorb Caravaggio's take on three key events from the man who wrote the Gospel according to St. Matthew. One painting stood out for me. St. Matthew and the Angel, you can see it there, and then you can see it over there too, whose flowing robes swirl to towards an elderly Matthew who wonders how to fill the empty pages of a journal lying before him. Ecstatic about seeing this seminal work, I left the church with a big game hunter's triumph after bagging a lion only I just have a postcard as my trophy. And then I spoke words to back Fred's thirsty agony. Because when you're alone, you know, agony and the ecstasy happens a lot. Uh, we can find more Caravaggio's near here. Further away, we found Caravaggio's interpretation of the oft replicated, and next slide, Judith and Ola Perna's Old Testament story of a young woman who charmed her way into a general's tent and beheaded him to save her. Some painters show Judith considering her upcoming deed. Others portray her fleeing, the general's head packaged in hand. Caravaggio spotlights the key shot, freezing action as a knife slices the general's throat, blood spurting on a pillow while his face rises in shock, pain, and terror. Perfect imagery for film directors like Roman Polanski and Martin Scorsese, men who capture harsh and violent acts with passion and pure. Like Polanski, Caravaggio proved his genius but spent time as a fugitive, leading the rest in the land of opportunity and continuing to create masterpieces while hiding in plain sight.
The men get to the heart of violence quickly. Caravaggio turned canvases into expressive interpretations of classic familiar actions, often with extreme gore. Put in more modern world events, Caravaggio would paint the watermelon moment of Kennedy's assassination, which took me to Texas. Well, actually, I went because the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth put together a display called Caravaggio and his followers in Rome. Long cultivating a reputation as a Texas art haven, Fort Worth offers an impressive array of museums and paintings, including one by Michelangelo. The Kimball owns a Caravaggio, a particularly rare bragging point in the United States. Admiring the paintings, I realized I never put any Caravaggio posters on my walls at home, so I checked around to find a suitable benign subject. Bacchus should work. The God of Wine. I decorate my kitchen with favorite wine bottles and great images. But Caravaggio used his own features for the exhibit's sick Bacchus from the Borghese Gallery in Rome. Besides lacking matinee or cheekbones, the artist bears a greenish cast in the painting, perhaps a moral lesson about the dangers of too much alcohol. No such preaching suits in my kitchen. I considered other works. In general, biblical topics and martyrdom's religious splatter bought my desire for a peaceable dwelling. While Caravaggio's work intrigued on an intellectual level, there's nothing in them to cheer the soul. But card players might work since the gambling, since gambling flourishes here at home in Nevada, and the Kimball boasts a Caravaggio called the Card Sharks. Suits Nevada, but it failed to capture me since I don't gamble much. However, I do like to write, and writers relate to someone contributing to part of the most read book of all time. Hmm. St. Matthew and the Angel, that painting I knew from Rome. It features beautiful colors and tells a story of inspiration without a drop of blood. That could work, and I could find a print at Walmart for $12.99. <laughs> So, and actually, when I wrote that, it was seven ninety nine, but inflation. So, a bit about Caravaggio-related films and his influence on films. Next slide. There is a movie called Caravaggio from the 1980s. Um, I think its high point is the way that the director recreates, has actors recreate the paintings. You can get a sense of some of the paintings. Uh, it's beautifully shot by Derek Jarman, who made his reputation as a set designer um, uh, for Ken Russell, a very visual filmmaker. Caravaggio is a little hard to find online um, these days, but and it's an odd movie. It's not a biopic. Back in the day when it was made, uh, there, there was less known about Caravaggio than is known now, and there's still not a whole lot. But in terms of written record, there's not even a hundred documents that tell about his life. And in terms of paintings, there's not even a hundred paintings. Uh, so a lot of what comes of what, what knowledge or what's shown in here is just theorizing, and it definitely has a very homoerotic sense to it. Um, with Caravaggio portrayed as gay, which could have been, but there's no proof of that either. Uh, early biographers said that, but in those days they were pretty mad at Caravaggio for the murder he committed and a few other things, and so we got a lot of really bad press um, that could have been exaggerated. So the film as a biopic, eh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, go with that, but it's an early role for Sean Dean and Tilda Swinton. It's uh, Swinton, who later went on to win an Oscar, worked up here on a movie called The Deep End, and that was her first film. If you Google or use whatever service you have, writing Caravaggio, you will come up with a lot of documentaries about him, a lot of uh, speeches on him. I found one today, it's very small, hard to read, but uh, it's in. Um, the Times of Malta.com. So Malta Times, and there's a, it's about 10 minutes, but it's a very good um, coverage of the paintings he did while in Malta and an excellent look at Malta as a destination. Next slide, are we running a short on time? Speaking of Malta, which is a, a fascinating place to visit, as I discovered, you can see Malta in a lot of films. Uh, it has a, a tank, so Pot Pie, the movie Popeye with Robin Williams actually filmed in Malta. But probably the most famous and popular for the moment would be the first two seasons of Game of Thrones, 
which um, you can either pretty easily buy them or they are still available on HBO. It's eight seasons, of course. But Malta plays um, uh, a couple of the key towns in the early scenes. I, just, I threw Jason Momoa in there just because there's an excuse. You always need an excuse to put <laughs> Jason Momoa's in, in uh, the first season when he marries uh, uh, Danaeus uh, by a rock, it's actually on the island of Gozo. And uh, it was a wonderful looking rock, I saw it. And about a year later, a storm came by, and after centuries and centuries of standing there, it's gone. Um, Game of Thrones is so popular that some of the people who worked on the series actually would give you tours of locations on, in Malta. If you, if you ever had a chance to go to Malta, Look it up and you can take a walking tour or even a little bit of a bus tour. This is Endina, which is one of the main towns used there. Okay, now we get to Caravaggio-inspired um, movies. Obviously, he came with a lot of religious shots or the scenes. That was the bread and butter for artists of his era. Uh, I mentioned St. Matthew. Um, the, the church in Rome has three scenes from Matthew's life if you want to know more about Matthew. The Gospel According to St. Matthew by the Italian great Pasolini, and he's a neo-realist filmmaker. That style is considered to be influenced by Caravaggio, who's credited with the, the first prominent use of the chiaroscuro lighting. Um, in paintings, they used to have a flat look to them. Caravaggio was one of the guys who really specialized in providing a lighting source for dramatic looking a beam of light just flashing here on, on my nose, and that we're all not the same looking. Um, religious topic in The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, who very much in interviews during the release of the film said he and his production designer studied the paintings of Caravaggio. That was a look they were going for in the film. And of course, a lot of the criticism of the film came because it was so violent, um, which I didn't criticize that movie for. You know, we see all these passive crucifixes and things like that, but think about how miserable and awful that really, truly was. Watch that movie and yeah, you get the, you, you get the sense of it. Um, obviously, people responded to it because it became the uh, biggest blockbuster of a religious movie ever filmed. Beyond Cecil B. DeMille, and others, but it will give you a sense of Caravaggio's um, visual style as well. And I think this is the, the last slide coming up. Yes, a couple of uh, other um, Caravaggio, to me, reminiscent. I don't know that E. Mark Bergman specifically credited Caravaggio with the look of the Seventh Seal, which is a classic, classic film. I just watched it within the last year, and I uh, hadn't seen it in decades, and I'm like, that really is a good, surrealistic movie. It's not your standard blockbuster, but there's a very good reason why it's considered such a classic. It has a starkness to its black and white imagery that is reminiscent of some of Caravaggio's canvases, like the, the one we saw uh, that's just got about like four or five figures in it. It's stark and yet rich at the same time. And there's a scene at the end, uh, towards the end of the Seventh Seal, involving a jail cell that looks like the same John the Baptist scene to me. Um, again, I can't say that he was specifically influenced by those paintings, but it reminded me of Caravaggio. Um, on the other hand, see the poster for Mean Streaks, a, a Martin Scorsese early film. It's got some coloring and emotion, and it's set up in the way a Caravaggio painting would be. And Scorsese specifically says, yes, he based the look of this film on Caravaggio's visual style, and he uses it repeatedly in his own movies. I did not put in a picture of The Godfather, but think about Godfather one, the, the orange film stock, the way those scenes are set up, the kind of lighting. That's very much Caravaggio. So that's why Caravaggio has had such an influence on films. And why I thought for our town, hey, let's talk about a painter and movies knowledge that art just covers so many different realms. Um, last slide is just a couple of the picture of the book again. Um, one of the reasons I'm hawking the book, uh, especially this one here, buy it for $20. It's under this price, but um, the 
proceeds, the bulk of them, or a good half of them, are going to the museum here and promoting a good cause. And some from the other one will go to the museum as well. You can pick them up here. I'll sign them here, but buy them down the stairs. Um, so that was the, uh, the, the promotional thing, but hopefully for a good cause. Because I think this is a great museum here. And I'm so glad you invited me to do this. I'm so glad you all came, too. Well, we still have more time for any questions, comments about, we can even talk about this and go as long, but Caravaggio or movies, movies in general, because we're in an unusual time when it comes to movie watching. Any questions, no questions about Caravaggio? Anybody want to go look up some of his paintings online? Yeah? Anybody going to go buy a Caravaggio poster for into their house? <laughs> And you got some ideas of different movies to watch during COVID. Uh, streaming has been pretty popular. So we've all had time to do that. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, I do reviews. I still am doing my program on KUNR. I record it at home, email it to the station. I can't go to a, a movie theater and see any new release on a big screen. But we're all able to watch either some new releases or things we hadn't thought about watching before and rethink them. So it's been fun to be able to continue programming despite our masked times. Mm -hmm. I have just a general question. What is your favorite movie that was ever filmed in the back? Favorite movie ever filmed in the back? Um, I think that Godfather Part Two is the best movie that did filming in the back. I love Godfather Part One, which also did filming in the back. Uh, but what I love about Godfather Part Two was something that we really criticized for when it came out. And that's the way it goes back and forth in time with Robert De Niro in what was essentially part one of the, the book, The Godfather, and then the newly invented story about um, the Godfather's son, Michael, at similar points in his life. So you see that even though uh, Don Corleone is a criminal, he has honor and certain um, steps he will not take. And Michael sort of starts that way, but it comes to a scene that's just beautifully filmed up here at Lake Tahoe, where he sends his brother Frito out on a boat and has his brother assassinated. It. Don Corleone would never do that. So the, to me, the contrast and where they, they broke apart, uh, I love the way it's structured. And I love the way it looks, just the filming. I think it's a great use of a location and a plot event. Um, a few years ago, uh, Barack Obama flew over Lake Tahoe and gave a speech up there. <laughs> and he said that uh, he was flying over Lake Tahoe, and, and The Godfather 2 is one of his favorite movies. And he looked down and he was going, oh, freedom. <laughs> So um, that, that's, uh, what, how about you? Anybody else have a bad movie that you particularly love? I was going to ask you what you think of uh, another Tavo movie, Things Change. Oh, I, I, I enjoy Things Change a lot, and I worked on that movie, uh, so I had a lot of fun with it. Um, <laughs> I got to sit down and have dinner with Don Amici and Joe Montaigne in the movie, David Gammon and I am the director and writer of um, met on a number of occasions, and it was one of the first movies I worked on, so one day I'm uh, up on the set, and he says, hey, have lunch with me, and I go, oh no, I gotta get back to Reno for something, and I did, and now I realize, wow, oh, that was pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fun movie. Um, it's cleverly written. Uh, of course, it's also stagey, and it was David's second movie. He's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, and director, um, but he was feeling his way into cinema. Um, it, it's a fun story, it's a nice story. Don Amici loved doing it. It was a great role for him. It wasn't his very last role, but it was close to it. And Joe Montaigne was on the rise, and he was just having a lot of fun doing that movie, too. Great use of locations. Harris on the South Shore, Calgary on the North Shore, uh, Ermin Mansion on the California side. So for me, it's fun to watch areas that I know quite well. Uh, what did you think of the movie? I enjoyed it, mostly for the, char mostly for the characters. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, good character development. Um, David considered it a pretty lightweight movie, influenced uh, you know, uh, 
mistaken identity, like uh, Connecticut Yankee Court, Yankee and King Arthur's Court, that type of story. So he wasn't meaning it to go on and, and become a film classic or anything. Just a fun movie to write and make and hopefully watch. Any other ideas about that movies or questions in, in that line? Anybody in particular? I was actually in a meeting the other day and somebody recommended the God Monster of India Flats <laughs> for summer entertainment. So I laughed and I've seen it. So I couldn't believe when you came well, back around again. Yeah, the God, God Monster, it, you know, it, it's, it's good for a laugh. Um, I think maybe it was some barbecue lamb. Um, <laughs> because you're watching it at home. And it's also fun to see, doesn't it have downtown Reno with, with the prima donna? I think so. So yeah. it's, you know, it's kind of fun to take a look at what Virginia Street looked like back in the day. And Virginia City, yeah, it's a little different, but not that different. What book are you talking about? The God Monster of Indian Flat, which is available for free if you're on Amazon Prime. God Monster of Indian Flat. Um, yeah, it's not one of those movies that I run around saying, oh, you've got to see this. <laughs> I can check it out first. Uh, did you see The Creeping Terror or Plan 9 from Outer Space? <laughs> if you like those, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that we have the misfits that were dating. And mm -hmm. Will and I like history. We've met people that were part of the people crowds. We just run across people and say, I was in the misfits. <laughs> and that's sort of a nice thing to do. We, we were talking about the misfits before. Um, uh, Jennifer was, uh, Jessica was at my song. Jessica was at a talk I did a number of years for the 50 year anniversary of the misfits. And uh, it's just an unusual movie. Then she got to work on a project dealing with the misfits. Oh, because it's still, people still watch it. It has held out so well. Um, it's probably, the biggest, uh, most extensive movie to film in this area. While I love The Godfather, and most of it filmed on the California side, and only half the movie takes place in Nevada, the Misfits pretty much filmed entirely here in a way that normally doesn't happen. They spent several months filming, not six weeks. Most, most projects today only want to shoot for six weeks. Um, and they did film sequentially. All the stars were here. They were walking around the community, so what you were hearing, people saying, I was in it, or I came across, or I saw the building. Anybody who was there at that time and saw anything in the business still remembers it. We were also talking about who would be equivalent to someone like Marilyn Monroe and Clark Gable today. Is there anybody quite of that stature? Uh, back then, Clark Gable was Rick Butler, the, the most romantic movie hero of his time. Today, maybe Brad Pitt would do that from an excitement. Uh, but I, right now I can't think of an actress who you would say has the same uh, recognizability as, as Marilyn. And apparently she charmed them. She charmed the, the people of the town of Dayton. I've heard a lot of that. The, the movie makers themselves had a difficult time because she was working <laughs> late. Yeah. She wasn't always happy with the way things were going. Um, it was difficult for Clark Gable, who is a, a, a much more, I'm on time, I know my lines, I do this, I do that. John Houston apparently didn't care so much because he was a gambler and he would just hang out at the names and gamble until she showed up. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's the story of her. Great yeah. story. But, but she did charm people, and, and um, anyone who came across her remembers it. And we still know who she is. You know, some of the other big actresses of, this, of the era, Susan Hayward was huge. How many people really remember Susan Hayward today? How many 20 year olds would know who she was? But pretty much everybody knows who Marilyn was, or is the legend of Marilyn. So, this is a very important movie for Nevada and still important today. Any other thoughts, questions? No, thanks, John. All right. Well, thanks again. And thank you very much. And again, the Robin's books are available here for you today to, to, to sign. And we look forward to seeing you at future events here at the Sparks Heritage Museum. Thank you to everybody joining us online. Good night. Thank you.